Dear colleagues and dear friends, good afternoon. We're about to start the press conference by the governor of the Bank of Russia, Elvira Nabirune, and the deputy governor, Alexei Zabotkin. And to start with, we'll hear from the governor about the results of the board of directors meeting. Good afternoon. Today we have made the decision to raise the key rate to 8.5 percent per annum. The economic situation has significantly changed in recent months. First, the recovery stage of economic growth is close to completion. Consumer demand is now expanding faster, and staff shortages have become more acute. Second, current inflation, including the increase in prices for stable components, has sped up. Third, the ruble has weakened. Finally, inflation expectations have risen. In such a situation, we have to start tightening our monetary policy in order to bring inflation back to 4 percent next year. I would now dwell on the reasons behind our today's decision. Firstly, Price pressure has been intensifying. Seasonally adjusted monthly price growth continues to speed up, and the increase in the majority of stable components of inflation exceeds 4% in annualized terms. Higher inflationary pressure is associated with demand in the first place. During the period of the recovery growth in the economy, demand was predominantly driven by the public sector. Today, the demand from the government remains high as well. In contrast, consumer demand was subdued until the end of last year. In early 2023, consumer demand started to expand, partly as, as a result of rising wages and consumer confidence, while in the second quarter, this growth accelerated even more due to a surge in lending. When demand starts to notably exceed the potential to ramp up supply, this inevitably pushes up prices as companies are unable to commission new manufacturing facilities and hire workers instantaneously. There are vivid examples illustrating such a situation. One of them is a surge in the demand for domestic tourism. In this case, the Russian hospitality industry needs a certain period to adjust to this rapid growth, namely to construct new hotels and create comfortable places for holidays. In addition, carriers' costs have risen considerably. However, it's the high demand for these services that has enabled companies to pass through these high cost to prices. I can give another example where rising demand cannot be met in full as the potential to quickly expand supply is limited. This is the automobile market. That is being analyzed in detail in our regional economy report. The expansion of demand is also a factor contributing to a fast recovery of imports. Combined with the contraction in exports, this rebound has become one of the reasons behind the ruble weakening. The recent movements of the exchange rate have not yet passed through to price in full. In addition to the direct pass through of the ruble exchange rate to prices, we are concerned about secondary effects that might occur. The dynamics of the exchange rate affect households and businesses' inflation expectations that remain elevated and unanchored. Moreover, they have risen in July. We will be closely monitoring further changes in inflation expectations and consider these trends when making our decisions. Taking into account all these factors, we have raised the lower boundary of our inflation forecast for this year by half of a percentage point, namely in between 2.5 to 6.5 percent. The monetary policy pursued will reduce the deviation of inflation from the target and will be aimed at returning it to 4 percent by the end of the next year. Secondly, as regards the economy. The recovery of economic growth is closely to completion. It was characterized by high quarterly growth rates of GDP. Such a fast increase is associated with the fact that during the recovery, companies start to use available resources, workforce and manufacturing capacities that were idle during the downturn. According to our monitoring of enterprises, unemployment has now dropped to a record low, while the utilization rates of manufacturing capacities have reached peak levels. This also suggests that the recovery will soon complete. After this, the growth rate of the economy normally becomes more balanced and more moderate. The economy has returned to its pre-crisis level overall, except for the oil and gas sector that is subject to tight external sanctions. However, due to the structural changes in the economy, trends significantly vary in certain industries and regions.
Most of those that are primarily focused on domestic demand have not only returned to the pre-crisis level, but are even beginning to surpass it. The other part of the economy focusing on exports still has very limited opportunities to completely restore output. Another important factor impeding a faster increase in output that is affecting all industries to a greater or less extent is staff shortages. In particular, our monitoring shows that about three-fourths of machine-building companies are facing staff shortages. Unemployment has dropped to a new record low. At some enterprises, employees work more than one shift as companies have increased the utilization of both workforce and manufacturing capacities. The headcount shortages of is most acute in the regions demonstrating high economic growth rate. This problem is exacerbated because of workers' low interregional and intersectoral mobility. Considering the quick rebound in demand, we have raised our GDP growth forecast for this year to 1.5 to 2.5%. Thirdly, with respect to monetary conditions. Although nominal interest rates, including yields on federal government bonds, have risen since our previous meeting, monetary conditions have been easing overall, predominantly due to non-price conditions. This is confirmed by the continuing steady upward trend in lending across all market segments. The expansion in retail lending is particularly fast. Specifically, mortgage lending growth has accelerated to its peaks levels recorded in recent years. The faster growth of household loans is driven by rising wages and elevated inflation expectations. High inflation expectations are an important factor contributing to an easing of monetary conditions. Considering these trends in our revised forecast that takes into account a monetary policy tightening, we have raised our estimate of credit to the economy for this year to 13-17%, which is higher than the average over the past five years. Now, I would like to speak of external conditions. The growth rate of the world economy is declining. This is influencing prices for Russian exports, including gas, coal and fertilizers, that are dropping in the global market. Thus, the sanctions on the economic cycle are both affecting Russian exports, combined with the expansion of imports. These factors explain the dynamics of the exchange rate we have been observing this year. Recently, the issue of the ruble exchange rate has been drawing a lot of attention, and I would like to elaborate on this. We believe that the main factor behind the exchange rate dynamics in June, July is the consequences of the shrinkage in exports over the past several months combined with increased imports. Normally, an exchange rate weakening causes a contraction in the demand for imports, but this has not yet happened. There are two reasons for this. The first one is time lags under contracts. The goods that are now imported to Russia were purchased at the exchange rate as of the dates of the supply contract signed some time before. The second reason, which is the key one, is that an increase in domestic demand causes a rise in the demand for imports. Considering these factors, the earlier weakening of the ruble is yet another confirmation that domestic demand has surged. In addition to export and import transactions, the exchange rate was also affected by the flows on the financial account. Specifically, last year, households' money transfers to foreign accounts increased. Many were wondering how this was affecting the dynamics of the exchange rate. In this regard, I can provide the following comparison. The 2022 exchange rate was strengthening for the most part of the year, although individuals were transferring significant amounts of funds to their foreign accounts. Compared to the second half of last year, such transfers have decreased nearly twice in the first half of this year, and in 2023, their amounts remain almost the same month on month. Other components of the financial account have predominantly declined as well. This is the second half of last year, including the operations related to decisions by the Government Commission on monitoring foreign investment that were at a minimum in May, June. Hence, the factor of capital flows generally has not been the main one for the movements of the exchange rate. The key is the dynamics of 
exports and imports. I will now speak of possible risks. Pro-inflationary risks have risen notably over the forecast horizon. They include a potential expansion of the gap between demand growth and opportunities to increase supply, partly due to consumer lending growth that might remain fast, and a further aggravation of the problem of staff shortages. Besides, a more rapid pass-through of the ruble weakening to prices, and possibly a long period of elevated inflation expectations are also pro-inflationary risks. A further worsening of external conditions, including a potential tightening of the sanctions, is yet another material risk. Disinflationary risks are minor. Winding up, I would like to comment on monetary policy prospects. Considering the changes in our assessment of the economic situation, we will need a higher path of the key rate to bring inflation back to its target to close to 4% by the end of next year. Our revised forecast factors in the adjustment in our estimate of the neutral rate upwards by half a percentage point, namely to in between 1.5 to 2.5% in real terms and 5.5 to 6 0.5% in nominal terms, the estimate of the neutral rate has been raised due to a higher risk premium for the Russian market and the increase in the external neutral rate. In our updated forecast, we have raised the average key rate to between 7.9 to 8.3% per annum for the current year and more significantly, specifically to in between 8.5 and 9.5% per annum for the next year. At our subsequent meetings, we admit the possibility of a further increase in the key rate. The percentage of a possible key rate increase will depend on how significantly incoming data will affect our estimate of the developments of the balance of risks to the achievement of the inflation target of close to 4% in 2024. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Dear colleagues, now we are doing the Q&A. Please introduce yourselves and name your agency. The first comes from Nastya in the first row. Thank you. Anastasia Savilova, Interfax Agency. In your press release, you are saying that the basic pro inflationary factor is the growing deviation of the economics from the balanced growth trajectory in terms of the supply and demand equilibrium. Can this situation be described as close to being overheated? And do we understand correctly that? Um, in the foreseeable future, you are going to pay particular attention to this risk, and simply because this risk uh, seemingly is not a short-lived short one, does it mean that uh, the current rate increase is not going to be enough and you might launch, launch a whole cycle of raising the rate? Second question, some of analysts are noting that your 100 basis point step could be interpreted in such a way that the rate should have been raised earlier considering the transmissionary lags. Do you share this view or do you believe that everything was done timely? With regards to the overheating, well, first of all, what is overheating? We don't have any quantitative criteria. Principally speaking, this is a material long-term deviation of the economic growth from the potential when the demand growth meets uh, the limitations on the supply side and transforms into a sped-up inflation. And so our policy is aimed at not allowing this risk to happen. And in order for the economics to grow at a balanced pace, with regard, with regard to what will come afterwards, we sent a signal that we allow for the possibility of the key rate being raised at our subsequent meetings. If you take a look at our key rate forecast, the lower boundary definitely is uh, interpreted as the current rate is going to be enough, but uh, in our mind, more probable is for us to raise the key rate during the next series of meetings. Now, as far as our today's decision is concerned, it was last time when we were saying th that we sent a message that the high key rate was possible. We 
had to gather additional information. So we currently see that inflation within its stable components is accelerating and the inflationary expectations have grown and the exchange rate dynamics and are basically listed above all the considerations that we took into account in order to come down to the decision that we have. And actually, I must note that the market has previously responded to this message in between the core meetings. Uh, colleagues, Rita, in the second row, please. Uh, Irina Shepilevsky, TAS Agency. And dear colleagues, I've got the following question. Could you please tell me how unanimous uh, your decision was to raise the key rate by 100 uh, basis points, and what were the additional decisions that you uh, looked uh, into? You also said that the step uh, hasn't been defined, but do you allow uh, in the future the same broad kind of an increase range? We were considering options to raise the key rate by 75 basis points and 100 basis points as well quite uh, substantively because there have been more radical uh, suggestions made, amongst other things, in order to further minimize the need to increase the rate. But, uh, Having done the analysis of the current situations and having looked into the balance of things, we made the decision that raising the key rate by 100 basis points was going to be a more, more optimal thing to do. Now, as to what kind of the next step uh, is going to be, shall depend upon the economic development, uh, uh, depend upon the data that is coming and the way the economics is going to react to this step consideration. Uh, Mr. Zabotkin, would you like to add something? Well, maybe the only thing that I could uh, also offer is that uh, the significant part of our discussion was dedicated to the uh, um, response tactics to the inflationary risks. Indeed, um, various ideas uh, uh, have been broached about a stronger and more speedy response, but ultimately the decision was made that one should uh, look over the way situation unfolds and this what kind of data comes in demonstrating the intensity of the inflationary pressure as well as the evolution of the inflationary expectations. Thank you. The next question comes up from online Anna Kozak, Moscow Komsomolitz portal from the city of Chita. Hello. For the beyond Baikal, the Trans-Baikalia area, more valid to us is the foreign exchange question, specifically with respect to UINs, the RMBs. Are the accounts like that are safe, and what will happen to the RMBs' interest rates? Well, indeed, we're currently observing a slightly peaking interest on the part of the Russian households to hold their money in the bank accounts in yuans, but this is not yet a broad practice. It accounts for about 1% of the total household's deposits in the banks. Now, with respect to what kind of currencies one should keep uh, money in, we're not issuing such guidance. We're not uh, interfering into the banking market practices, um, unless such practices don't pose direct risks to the households and the system generally. But of course, one should understand that any foreign currency deposit, no matter what currency it is, carries within itself a certain foreign exchange risk. And the difference the, um, between the uh, sales rate and uh, buying rate uh, can impact the income because, because of the volatility. Uh, any ex foreign exchange account looks like an investment whereby it's impossible to forecast uh, the exchange rate volatility and the exchange rate risk. Uh, but making up one's mind, one should also remember that we still have various Airfax uh, restrictions. You cannot withdraw from uh, a uh, foreign currency deposit, you may get your money in rubles at the bank's exchange rate with respect to a specific currency in question. And if an individual is aware of such risks and is ready to take them, like in case with any investments that is at this individual's discretion. Um, dear colleagues, uh, Dmitry, the second row now. Dmitry Butinko from Commerce Central. 
Well, originally it was expected that the neutral rate range was going to be changed in the monetary policy sometime by September. So in the forecast, the neutral rate uh, has been range has been changed. Now the question, is it the same procedure or different? Is there a probability that by September you would again reassess this range and uh, the 0.5 is no longer going to be that? Now, if it's not the case, most probably it's not the case, can you share certain considerations? about how that change might occur in terms of what it will account for, country risks or maybe some other factors are going to be playing more up. We have changed our assessment of the neutral rate range in our main guidelines for the monetary policy. We keep to uh, retain the same kind of assessment because this is our last core meeting before the main guidelines of the monetary policy are being made public. And so today's forecast, consequently, is going to be made part of the first draft of it. And later on, it will be further specified as we further discuss the subsequent guidelines and the new data comes in most importantly. Now, as far as the specific composition of the factors uh, is concerned that uh, were behind our reassessment, I would ask Mr. Zavocchi to comment. Well, to avoid discrepancies. In the main guidelines, we further specify the forecast and the final draft of the document will be prepared on the basis of the October forecast uh, um, that uh, uh, will be uh, submitted into the Russian parliament. So the August first draft is based upon the July forecast so that you understand the sequence now in terms of what impacted, um, um, because in the guidelines, the traditional document, there will be an insert about the way we think about the neutral rate. So in terms of the changes uh, towards, uh, uh, I shall put it this way, uh, the decrease of the neutral rate in our mind, uh, we feel that there is a potential decrease in the potential economic growth pace, um, uh, moving it upward, which is greater risk premium in this uh, uncertain environment, as well as uh, a view that if judged by the global external neutral rate, it has also shifted itself upwards somewhat compared to what it used to be back in 2020, when the neutral rate uh, valuation was brought down. Now, in terms of the quantity of decomposition, I think I shall refrain from a specific statement. And I would like to remind you once again uh, that this is not a monitored indicator. This is um, an assumption, uh, an evaluation. Uh, dear colleagues, Rita, please. Margarita Mordovina, RBK Agency. Uh, my question is going to be about the today's announced new mechanism which envisages the uh, selling of 288 uh, uh, yuans and rubles uh, in yuan equivalent. Could you please tell us uh, where does this decision come from? Uh, can it be considered as uh, a certain support for the ruble? And to what extent it is related to the assessment by a number of analysts who are saying that the Minister of Finance Finance soon is going to stop uh, selling yuans out of the National Welfare Fund. My second question about the central bank's assessment uh, into the yuan's contribution into the ruble weakening. You mentioned that this effect hasn't yet played itself completely out. Does the central bank have some, have some sort of a forecast um, what kind of a weakening contribution may come from yuan, considering the soon coming end of summer? Well. During the time when the decision was made that part of the welfare, National Welfare Fund is going to be used for investment purposes, an announcement stated that uh, this kind of spending is going to be reflected in the mirror-like fashion. Then, because of certain circumstances, it was put on hold, and uh, well, uh, there were reasons to reconsider that and return to that practice. But that was not aiming for um, somehow artificial rural exchange rate handling. No, that was specifically for the purposes of the mirror-like reflection of it. And as to the Minister of Finance, expectedly. Uh, uh, 
stopping to sell you irons, that will depend upon the imports and exports and the extent to which the basic um, uh, revenue demonstrates itself. In, I mean, uh, how well do we follow the course in terms of our assessment of the oil and gas uh, income? But I will ask Mr. Zabotkin to also add a word. Well, regular transactions within the fiscal rule, they are being defined based on the formula which is linked to the actual oil and gas revenue um, compared to the basic uh, oil and gas revenues. And so in this sense, these are going to change depending upon the oil and gas market environment, um, including the gas and oil exports. Now, as to why we have made this decision right now, it is explained by the fact that in July, we have uh, drawn the line um, underneath the uh, National Welfare Fund investments uh, over the first half year. You know that the fiscal statistics, they uh, come by the middle of the next month, which is following the reporting period. And so currently we may uh, see the uh, amount of transactions that we need to uh, mirror uh, simply because the uh, National Welfare Fund investment transactions are less uh, evenly spread in time. So it is uh, more comfortable to mirror than by averaging the amount of transactions within a certain significant period of time. So we decided that it should be half a year. And that is why we're currently doing it. Right. And as far as um, transferring or passing through the ruble weakening into prices, this pass through has already commenced. Usually, it happens throughout the year. Its uh, main part uh, happens within half year. But in terms of the whole of the pass-through process, it may be affected by different factors. And one of them, like I previously stated, i.e. that the imports are still having the old period prices. Additionally, last year, when ruble was appreciating, many businesses believed that transitory, and so in terms of their business plan and import contracts were uh, built upon a weaker kind of exchange rate uh, compared to what it was then. And so the ruble weakening passed through had to be measured by not the actual one, but by the one that the companies signed their import contracts uh, and packed them to. So it could be drawn out in time. Thanks very much. The next question comes from Alexander Waltz uh, from online. Life and Finance Project. Good afternoon. I have a question which is concerning many retail investors. After the decree number eight came out, the Bank of Russia came out with interpretation March 8th, and based on that, the investors again has to seek uh, approval to enter into transactions with non-friendly residents. But while trading through foreign brokers, uh, investors cannot know who is the counterparty. And so henceforth, I've got several questions to raise. Is it possible to transact via friendly uh, structures, for example, like Kazakhstan, where it is expected that all the counterparties parties are friendly and what the people can do with the brokerage accounts in the United States, what investors may do in case a foreign broker may demand to immediately close the account and so an investor will be forced to divest from the, the papers or securities without any permit because to get one within a short period of time won't be possible. And what uh, the people can do who don't live in Russia or uh, within a given year spend less than 180 days in Russia and they're not Russian citizens and as a consequence they are subject to FX legislation. Now, are they subject to this particular decree? Because they don't have to report on their foreign accounts. Thank you. Yes, we are familiar with the concern that investors express towards this issue. Yes, there is a bit of a legal limbo about it. And so quite shortly, we will analyze various options thoroughly and we will try and supply investors with certainty. Thank you. Delia, in the last row, please. Good afternoon. Ria Novosti, Delia Rasolnseva. Ilvide Sahib Zadona. Several times you've previously mentioned uh, the possible uh, rate increase this year. But already within this year, 
can it grow up to a double-digit uh, uh, value? Has the central bank considered this? You have also raised uh, your inflation forecast, but also along the lower boundary, you kind of narrowed that range. But how high are the risks that the inflation this year, towards the end of it, uh, may surpass the upper threshold, which is 6.5 percent? Our basic forecast it points to five to six point five percent, but at the same time, we're saying that pro-inflationary risks, as far as the base uh, forecast is concerned, are prevailing. So we will further specify forecast if need be, as the new data arise. Now, as far as the rate is concerned, no, we're not forecasting rates. We come out with an average rate either for the year or for the remainder thereof. So our forecast for the average key rate for the remainder of the year is in between 85 to 9.3%. Thank you. Dear colleagues, Sergei, in the second row, please. Sergey Bolotov, arguments and facts. I've got two questions. Both are related to possible negative consequences from the 1% rate hike. The minister, head of the Ministry of Finance is saying that is it the Russian banks that are most often are buying the government debt, and they do it with the uh, money borrowed from the central bank, and that currently they uh, value the borrowing rates uh, as too high in terms of the government bonds. Won't it lead, as the result of the higher rate, that the Minister of Finance will be forced to give up on uh, selling the federal bonds and instead will be reducing the public uh, spending and um, uh, having some uh, public property privatized. My second question uh, is that the public spending and particularly the defense order is not very sensitive to a higher rate. If some defense factory, for example, committed to producing 200 tanks, it will produce 200 tanks, whatever, no matter what rate is. I mean, the civil sector uh, can consume or can tighten the belt. Uh, so to what extent do do you believe that there is stability in terms of the demand becoming livelier? Wouldn't it be simpler to wait until the household um, realize their um, delayed uh, demand so that the expectations for the rate will dissipate? Thank you. As far as the first question is concerned, I would say that the banks are funding the acquisition of the government securities, uh, like in the case of uh, loans and the corporate bonds, uh, raising for that purpose. Uh, the deposits from the households and the businesses. At the point in time when the uh, federal bonds are being placed, the current temporary liquidity uh, moves from the banking system into the government treasury. But as the government spending is taking place, this money comes back to the, bank, to the banks in the form of the new deposits uh, put down by the businesses and the household. And so in such an environment, the banks may require short-term liquidity for that uh, period in between the placement of the uh, bonds uh, when the fiscal system raises money and uh, the uh, government spending. And at that point in time, they do raise liquidity from the central bank. But that doesn't alter the substantive things, because the substantive thing in it is that funding the new federal bonds comes from the deposits which emerge in the economics due, amongst other things, uh, additional government spending. And through that mechanism, um, uh, the government is lending to the banks rather than the monetary emission, monetary issues that uh, the uh, fiscal uh, shortage impacts the money mess. Now, the cost of borrowing for the government, uh, you've asked this question, won't uh, the high key rate lead to the borrowing cost for the government uh, becoming higher? But the cost of borrowing for the government, uh, like in the rest of uh, the case of the borrowers, is defined by the level of inflation and inflationary expectations against high inflation, against unanchored inflation expectations, the key rate and the interest rates are going to be high. But with against a consistent monetary policy, which is aiming for the price stability, the cost of funding, including the public system, is going to decline. Because it is impossible to imagine that our key rate is low and the inflation is high, that uh, the economic rates are going to go down. Exactly the reverse thing will happen. Exactly the reverse one, because the inflation expectations are going to grow, the inflationary premium is going to uh, be high. And so our policy is specifically aimed at making 
making sure that the economy has the moderate rate in as far as the long-term borrowing is concerned. Yes, Mr. Zabotkin? A very vivid example actually uh, comes from the fact that the key rate uh, doesn't generate direct impact upon the level of interest rate. And uh, um, you may take a look at the situation since September this year because the key rate remains unchanged, 7.5% until now, uh, while <coughs> the federal bond rates have significantly grown against the fact that the key rate remained unchanged. And they have grown in many ways because gradually the inflationary pressure um, was uh, becoming stronger and the inflationary expectations remained elevated. As far as the second question is concerned, you are quite right. Not all of the components of the aggregate demand are equally sensitive to the uh, monetary policy. Uh, and you're also right uh, saying that there has been a certain effect of a delayed demand throughout the first half this year. But alongside with that, our estimate is that we believe that the recovery of the consumer demand as well as the expansion of the investment demand do demonstrate stable nature, which is supported by the income growth, active lending growth, and it is least probable that these trends will hmm, pivot somewhere on their own uh, volition. So the high employment supports uh, growing income, and that improves the credit worthiness of household. The banks are more willing to uh, lend because the incomes are higher, and so the fast-growing aggregate demand incentivizes the business's lending activity, whereby the business are also willing to take more and the banks are willing to give more. Uh, similarly, uh, the redness, uh, high redness to borrow is also being supported by high inflationary expectation because when businessmen are expecting inflation to continue growing, they are um, uh, taking more loans. Now, against uh, the uh, government uh, demand remaining elevated, if the private sector also continues uh, such a growth, it will transform itself more vividly into the high inflationary expectation, and that's why we're making our decisions about the monetary policy, which are aimed at making this higher demand not to transform into simple price growth rather than the physical growth of output and consumption, which realistically means an improvement of well-being. Thank you. Now, next question comes online from Yekaterinburg, from Alexei Prokopiev. Bank Inform Service Project. Will the central bank continue restrictions? <clears throat> imposed upon the withdrawal of the cash currency from the bank accounts. Uh, I am not planning to introduce any changes into it. Uh, these restrictions are in effect until September 9th. We haven't yet made up our mind, but at this point in time, one may say that there are no prerequisites for these restrictions to be suspended. These restrictions, I shall remind you, uh, were put in place because of the sanctions imposed upon the imports of the cash foreign currency by the Russian banks into the territory of Russia. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, uh, your questions, please. Uh, Fyodor, from the first row. Fyodor Ivanov, Invest Future. Good afternoon. I would like to ask um, uh, the central bank many times uh, said that the key factor behind uh, the depreciation of ruble is the declining exports against the growing imports. However, there is quite a notable correlation between uh, the uh, foreigners, uh, non-friendly foreigners, selling their assets in Russia to the Russian buyers and the declining ruble exchange rate. Has the central bank uh, evaluated the impact from such transactions and how significant it is? Yes, of course, we are looking at all of the factors, and so our assessment is that the main factor was in the changes within exports and imports. While the capital flow does generate a certain impact upon the exchange rate, but speaking about the specific factor that you've referred to, these are the transactions uh, under the government commission um, uh, approvals uh, of uh, respective uh, securities being bought, uh, the stock being bought. On the contrary, these have gone down and they were minimized in May, June. So this factor currently is not in any way meaningful in terms of the exchange rate evolution that we've been observing over the past several months. Thank you. Anna, please. 
Oh, Nicole, uh, is this a newspaper? I also have two questions. And the first uh, comes uh, from the Curiosity area um, in St. Petersburg during the Economic School. I personally discovered that not a single time the head of the central bank used its uh, last word prerogative if the number of votes on the board was equal. Now, this time, considering the uh, broad opinions uh, you refrain from uh, using this, and hypothetically, is it possible at all to happen like that? Or your consensus is always so solid? And my second question, uh, during the St. Petersburg Forum, Mr. Siulanov told us that the subcommission governing um, uh, strategic foreign investments uh, made up its mind already that the uh, those who are buying uh, exiting companies companies uh, will have to uh, do it at 20% discount, which they will have to uh, direct to the Moscow Exchange. And so my question is, won't the central bank uh, be willing to suggest that the similar kind of practice should also be uh, covering Danone and Baltica, because these are two major companies, and that could support our stock market and redirect some of the resources uh, from the consumption side into the investment side. Thank you. As far as the way the decision-making process is taking place, we usually do not disclose the way we vote, uh, at least uh, in the current uh, period. We are trying to arrive at a consensus, and the fact that we've been discussing different options doesn't mean that we have defined it uh, uh, in relationship to the voting process. No, we materially uh, looked into different ways to rate the key rate, the pros and contras of it, and indeed, the, there was no need, I mean to say, for me to utilize my um, decisive vote um, authority. Well, another person who was also present uh, in the board meeting, uh, I can confirm there was a very broad consensus in support of the uh, suggestion uh, to raise it to the rate to 8.5 percent. Although in the course of the preliminary discussion during the week, uh, various ideas have been expressed. And as far as uh, taking the shares to the exchange and creating the free flow situation. Principally speaking, I shall say that any measures that might support this trend is what we are welcome because our free flow is very low. And, and when the government commission is uh, making such decisions um, and there is such a condition being described as far as a specific transaction is concerned, it's hard for me to comment, but principally speaking, we are uh, for there being different measures which stimulate uh, companies to raise more resources from the capital market because quite often they fund their business expansion and the new project out of the debt burden and lending. And so uh, the potential of the capital market, we believe, is untapped uh, quite significantly, we think. Thank you. The next question comes online from Denise Yelohovsky. Complex percentage or complex interest project. Good afternoon. I've got two questions. The first is when and to what extent the weakening of the ruble in the uh, end of June, beginning of July is going to uh, pass itself through into the consumer price index and uh, how currently the central bank assesses this pass through effect. I mean, to what extent and within which period of time, let's say, uh, we may see the effect of 10 percent more or less. And the second question about the digital ruble. How does the central bank uh, view the public uh, reaction to this digital ruble project? Uh, is the central bank ready to accept uh, the fact that uh, there is quite a skepticism uh, uh, towards it? Uh, if you're ready to accept it, so what are you planning to do about it? If you're not ready to do anything about it, why? Thank you. Well, as far as the pass-through effect is concerned, based on our estimates. Uh, when the exchange rate uh, goes down 10 percent, the annual inflation grows somewhere by about 0 0.5, 0 0.6 percentage points. But I would like to immediately uh, note that it is incorrect to multiply the actual exchange rate call, uh, cause within a certain period by that ratio and consider it to be a top-up of inflation. That is incorrect. First of all, like I've previously said it already, the additional inflation 
is not embracing the exchange rate pass-through, but it's deviation from the expectations about the exchange rate changes which were there before the ruble weakened last year. Again, I shall say the ruble has appreciated strongly. But for 2023, many market players, uh, like our service show, expected the ruble to be weaker than it was in the second half of 2022. And then the pass-through speed is also being impacted by the import and export stocks. They were quite material, and they were created uh, on the basis of a very solid um, exchange rate in the second half that doesn't diminish the overall scale of the pass-through, but it simply makes it play out uh, throughout a lengthy period of time. And secondly, the exchange rate dynamics, particularly now, is very strongly related to the domestic demand uh, dynamics, which uh, uh, affects uh, imports and through, via imports the exchange rate and the extent to which the exchange rate changes are related to it, the exchange rate impact upon prices is the part of a general pro inflationary pressure which comes from the expanding demand. So, this is part of the general demand inflation. Now, and as far as the digital ruble is concerned, yes, we do note this uh, reaction. We are monitoring the way the households and the market players uh, respond to to this innovation? Yes, there is a certain skepticism, but we remember seeing the same one against any innovation being proposed to the financial market. I remember a whole pile of question and skepticism with regard to the mere card uh, uh, that almost half of the Russian population is currently using. And the payment cards, actually, whenever they were um, coming into the market, people were skeptical about it, which is quite natural. So what can you do? You just raise the awareness, you know, share more information, and let people try it, because nobody is going to uh, strong arm anybody into the digital ruble. This is absolutely just an additional option for the people, their choice, that they want to use it, okay. If they don't, okay. But we believe that it's going to be cheaper, much more convenient, both for the house and the businesses that will start using it again. This is just yet another option. Dear colleagues, please, Grigori, in the first row. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Grigory Bajenov. I'm the author of the Popular Economics and the Economic Science blog. I have two questions. The first one is about what you've yourself stated, that the dynamics related to the demand but in many ways is brought about by the public spending dynamics. And so overall here we may talk about a certain tension where there is a disbalance between the supply and demand, at least within some sort of a short period. Um, so because of that, I uh, have a question. Does the central bank believe that the risks of the fiscal dominance nation are becoming stronger. So that is my first question. The second one is about the exchange rate. You partially gave us the explanation, so it's an extension of the previous one. But there is another point, because you yourself uh, spoke about the secondary effects as a result of the depreciation of the exchange rate that is going to impact the inflationary expectations. And so if you are talking about the pass-through effect directly, that uh, as opposed to the expectations, the exchange rate changes, and that will impact inflation. So how do you believe the exchange rate changes will translate into the inflationary expectation changes and how overall that will transform into the inflation dynamics. Well, the public spending and the public demand, particularly last year, uh, generated a material impact, but the uh, you know, private demand went down. So effectively, the public demand substituted that. And so currently, what we see is that the public demand remained at an elevated level, while the private demand is growing. It has grown practically up to the level of the end of 2021 and continues to nudge up. Of course, if the supply is not catching up, that may transform into inflation. And so, if uh, the government demand remains at an elevated level, in order for the gap between the demand and supply not to uh, provoke inflation, uh, the toughening of the monetary p policy is what we're doing, which will impact the private lending and the private demand. Now, as far as the fiscal domination is concerned, I mean, this kind of a fiscal domination may be expressed uh, in the countries with a big uh, sovereign debt uh, or some extreme form thereof. When the rates are growing, I mean, the shortages uh, <laughs> 
become more pronounced and the sovereign debt grows and the rates are growing in order, amongst other things, to limit uh, the um, space for the private lending. <clears throat> and the government has to spend more and more to service this government debt for the which purpose the shortages strengthen even more. And that is a bit of a spiral. But happily enough, we are not in this kind of environment because our sovereign debt is not high. And we are aware of the government intention to gradually consolidate the fiscal uh, system and the budget. Could you add something? Well, the only thing I may add is that the risk of the budget domination, dominance, uh, the, the authorities have always to bear this in mind in the process of a long-term fiscal planning. As far as the secondary effects are concerned, yes, indeed, you very nicely put it, there is a correlation between the two, and the exchange rate dynamics is, is significant, but not the only factor which impacts inflationary expectations, but it is significant. I mean, the inflationary expectations may be dependent upon uh, the uh, staple products, uh, which are the d demand markers, when prices grow for them, and other things. But quite naturally, the inflationary expectations, these are the ones which actually create dangerous secondary effects when households may expect prices to grow uh, within a broad range of products. And this inflationary expectations push people into a faster consumption spending because they are afraid that uh, prices will uh, uh, be ahead of them, and that may exacerbate the gap between the supply and demand and impact inflation. That is exactly what we are worried by, and that is why we are making the kind of the monetary decisions which are specifically a aimed at restricting this inflation deviation from the target level um, um, and keep it uh, low and predictable. Thank you. And the next question comes from Vologda City, from Alexei Tretyakov. The Krasny Sever newspaper. Alexei, please. Good afternoon. <coughs> the weakening of the ruble exchange rate uh, also had some information related to, to it that some of the households rushed to buy uh, sugar, refined sugar, in big amounts. But uh, as it turned out, that there is no hoarding taking place these days in the stores. Could you please tell us what one should do in this information environment to ordinary people who are afraid for their savings? All right, thank you. You mentioned about the uh, um, refined sugar prices, but principally speaking, these prices are quite volatile. If you trace back uh, these dynamics over the years, um, the way they went down, I mean, the, the prices went up, uh, sorry, when we had this uh, agitated demand uh, in the March last year, then in the remainder, throughout the remainder of the year, they notably went down. Uh, again, uh, these prices have been growing over the past few months, but still, uh, the sugar prices are lower than it was in June last year, but I understand that your question is not rather about the sugar prices, but about hoarding when people buy to stock, can't being afraid uh, that the prices will grow. Yes, sometimes that happens in response to uh, people uh, seeing uh, prices uh, climbing. And actually, that is what we describe as elevated inflation expectations. Uh, remember 2015 and the beginning of the pandemic? Even last year, people were making big uh, stocks, uh, uh, the facial masks uh, and the buckwheat uh, and the household appliances, following which uh, prices for these products uh, would uh, materially drop. So what can one say? Against a low level of inflation, in terms of there being any reason for uh, continuing growth uh, in prices, it is not there. And so our monetary policy is specifically aimed at making sure that the overall price level uh, being maintained at a target, because we cannot uh, uh, influence uh, individual product uh, prices uh, all the time. So these prices are being impacted by supply and demand within a product market. But if we pursue, and we pursue our policy at maintaining general price stability and what we're trying to make sure that even against short-term uh, volatility with respect to certain products prices, there wouldn't be any unpredictable um, 
price growth within a consumer basket and the purchasing power of a household and savings of income uh, is not undermined. That is what our policy is aimed at. Thank you. Elena, please. In the row before that, Elena Fabrichna, Reuters. You gave us an example about the demand. Internal domestic tourism was supported in the automobile purchase, but do you allow for that being just transitory factors because um, uh, later on that may subside? And on the other uh, side, the analysts believe that the weakening of the ruble was the key factor which forced you to um, raise the rate by 100 percentage points rather than 50, as was the expected market con consensus. And the weakening of ruble, does the central bank continue to monitor how the exporters are selling their uh, revenue? Because there is a certain suspicion that they are uh, kind of holding it back by accumulating it in the foreign accounts. By August 1st, the president tasked to be given certain ideas about the currency regulation, what kind of changes may happen, what the central bank may come up with? Well, let me begin with the weakening of the ruble. It is indeed a material factor, but not the key one. In our mind, the key factor currently for us is uh, the demand uh, being stronger than the capacity of supply to follow it up. And that is on the side of the supply limitations, like I've mentioned, including the headcount shortages. But alongside with that, as far as transitory factors are concerned, you know, whenever there is a price growth covering a broad spectrum of products. So some of the products and services may be higher, some not so. And so in such sectors, the higher kind of a demand, I mean, the fact that the demand is uh, higher is demonstrated by the costs or insufficient supply easily passing themselves through into prices. Uh, I guess this is it. Uh, Mr. Zabotkin, would you add something? Well, maybe yet again I shall repeat that uh, the decision with respect to the monetary policy are always reliant upon a uh, comprehensive uh, forecast rather than just an individual factor doing more or less. Yes, indeed, the exchange rate is there. But in combination with all the rest of the data coming in, and here I would like to point, draw attention to what was uh, mentioned um, in the uh, uh, governor's statement, a considerable share of the exchange rate dynamics reflects the import dynamics, the import one, while the import growth is the function of the domestic demand. And principally, that is the only thing, unless we are having certain physical restrictions to cope with. If that is the case, the exchange rate dynamics Mm -hmm. delivers a lot of data to us uh, describing the uh, demand dynamics. You have to take into account, of course, the exchange rate doesn't speak only of that. It tells us what's happening on the export side and capital transactions. But as far as the exchange dynamics explains, is being explained by the import dynamics, is what is the consequence of the demand. As far as exporters selling their revenue, we continue to monitor this there are several factors at play which affect the volume of uh, uh, water exporters sell in the FX market, i.e. that part of the export revenue is now in rubles, and that is why these are importers who are buying FX in the market and then making rubles, uh, taking rubles to pay for exports. Now, from the point of view of the currency part of the export revenue, coming into this country, its share hasn't gone down at all. Our exports of volumes have. We're also analyzing the extent to which the exporters are leaving um, their assets in the foreign accounts. Based on our data, uh, this is not much, just within 1% of the export revenue total. 
um, as regards uh, the currency regulation, the facts regulation, and the various proposals to change it. You may remember that last year we went through two stages uh, of uh, currency restrictions uh, being changed. Firstly, very strong restrictions were introduced. Uh, later, uh, gradually, those were liberalized, but nevertheless, there is quite a volume of different restrictions that have been accumulated with various decision-making systems and with exemptions, and businesses find it hard to navigate through it. So we heard questions already today, what the, those uh, individual things mean. So we're currently doing an inventory of the measures that were put in place in terms of analyzing their effect. And our position, the Bank of Russia's view, is that we need to keep only those effects restrictions which are um, material in terms of the response measures, while the rest of them should be suspended and so as to allow businesses to develop new logistical chains and build relations with the new counterparties. Well, I guess that is the way. Thank you. The next question comes from Yekaterina Litova from Vedmas. Yekaterina, please. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. I have two questions. The first uh, is that some analysts uh, link the ruble weakening, amongst other things, due to the fact that its share in payment for exports has considerably grown, so the supply of foreign currency went down in the Russian market. Does the central bank share this point of view? Additionally, does the central bank uh, not plan to report the market on a regular basis about the one-time capital movement in the currency market when non-residents are coming in or going out or the banks are closing their currency position. And my second question about the mortgage market, the key rate growth makes it for the banks uh, issuing the, exact, the subsidized mortgage more attractive. On the one hand, there is a greater profitability from this uh, kind of lending, while for the household, there is a greater difference between the subsidized mortgage and the market based mortgage rates. Don't you see here any new risks for the real estate market whereby the difference uh, in between the new housing and the secondary property market uh, growing further? As far as the impact on the exchange rate dynamics coming from the fact that um, some of the payment for exports are being ruble denominated, like I said in my answer to the previous question, in order to pay in rubles, an importer must sell currency and buy rubles. So we see that it overall is neutral. I mean, there may be some uh, deviation, but overall that is neutral. As far as disclosing information <coughs> about the capital flow, we are reviewing this topic. Uh, we will see what can additionally be disclosed. So in the meantime, we haven't had yet any plans uh, towards it. Well, definitely just to expect the central bank. Uh, not only is that, yeah, I mean, uh, just to really go through every niche transaction, I mean, uh, and then share what is our interpretation of the capital flow points would be naive because you can only assess it only within a significant period of time. I mean, on the quarterly basis, we are disclosing the payment balance statistics in the uh, um, uh, uh, amount of data put out as uh, we uh, decide. As far as mortgage market is concerned, uh, the mortgage rate of growth, we believe, is very high. I mean, as far as subsidized mortgage and the arbitrage between the rates, the parameters of the subsidized mortgage uh, are being defined by the government, and we're ready to have a discussion if uh, certain changes are being proposed. Now, with respect to price gap between the primary and the secondary real estate market, indeed, that has been our concern, because if there is such a big gap, that generates risk for the households in the first place who resort to mortgage uh, uh, tools. Uh, we believe that the main contribution into this gap came from the developers' mortgage lending, which practically have come to a standstill. So in terms of there being any additional provocation for that gap to become stronger or grow, we don't see it. There are certain new marketing schemes out there, which we monitor and analyze in terms of the impact upon the primary and secondary market, so far we haven't noticed any new systemic risks. Thank you. Marina, please. 
Marina Pimino, NTV Business News. After yesterday's sanctions, the union paid Tinkov uh, Bank card will no longer work, and the Solidarność Bank. So, and this is the peak of vacation, so people will have to take along more of cash in foreign currency. Is there enough foreign exchange cash in the country? Uh, does the central bank think about introducing any new temporary measures to restrict that? No additional temporary restrictions is what we are going to not. Uh, we're not going to introduce it because we don't see any reasons uh, to it. But there are certain difficulties with pay payments when such sanctions are being imposed. The people in the street you know, find it harder uh, to uh, effect transactions uh, to pay for their travel services. But we're working with many countries um, um, trying to uh, uh, um, establish a system where the mere card or certain other uh, payment systems uh, can be adopted so that uh, uh, our people find it can convenient. But there is a problem, and this is the consequence of the sanctions. And uh, the cash exchange rate uh, currently, as far as the foreign currencies are concerned, are very close to non-cash exchange rate. And so the kind of a disbalance that we remember last spring by autumn was completely exhausted. Thank you. The next question comes online from Simple Economics Telegram channel. Uh, lately, some of the Russian banks uh, are proposing accounts in some exotic uh, currencies for Russian depositors in dirhams and rupees, while the Moscow exchange is not trading in this currency yet. So what may uh, be the kind of risks for those who may have such uh, accounts? And what does the central bank think about these uh, unconventional currencies does it plan to regulate this? As far as the currencies are concerned, which are being traded in the Moscow exchange, it is true that due to the currency regulation, some of the countries' uh, uh, currencies are not being traded in at the Moscow exchange. As far as the currency deposits are concerned, uh, foreign currency deposits, well, as I said, people do adopt an additional risk, and they must become aware of it. I shall reiterate it again. This, in many ways, is similar to investments, although that's a deposit, this is a saving, but in many ways that looks like an investment because there are factors behind it which are more unpredictable in terms of the yield uh, um, related to the exchange rate changes and the decisions made by the regulators in other jurisdictions. And as always, one also must not forget that the sales and uh, sell and buy spread, if you want to convert it into the national currency, may eat into this uh, 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 savings. So before you open up your current foreign currency account, you need to calculate all of the effects. And again, due to the existing restrictions, our foreign currency accounts are rather ruble-denominated accounts which are being in Dexed by the currency exchange rate. Uh, colleagues, uh, Konstantin in the last row, please. Thank you. Konstantin Tsiganikov, Money24, Moscow24 channel, being representative of the capital city of Russia, um, is about, would like to ask about what the Moscovites are more concerned uh, by. You also mentioned uh, the mortgage, and so my question to what extent the higher rate may cool down the mortgage market, and does the mortgage market need this kind of a cooling effect? Several months ago, we spoke about the developer's mortgage. God knows, devil knows what kind of scheming, and that has become a popular buzzword. Now the banks are following the new old scheme. Pay us the fee, and we will reduce your interest rate. It's going to be a market-based one. The central bank already mentioned that doesn't impact the cost of the apartments offered by the developer, but, uh, but the central bank is planning to monitor it. So now, against a higher rate, when I'm sure the banks are going to be more active in pushing this particular element forward, how will the central bank's attitude may change towards it. Don't you believe that the ability to pay money in order to buy oneself an interest rate is a sinful thing? Well, first of all, availability on mortgage is an important factor of an available housing. But 
And that's where many ifs and buts start. The important thing is that uh, the mortgage uh, activity must not be at the expense of the risky mortgage where people are not able to service it uh, from their income. They end up being in a have a predicament, being overburdened with debt, not being able to service it. And secondly, that must not, I mean, the, the uh, quick development of mortgage must not transform into a higher cost of housing because effectively that won't mean availability of housing. These are the two basic principles that are important to us. The mortgage uh, is currently demonstrating very high pace growth, and that is why we are taking measures in order to reduce mortgage growth for the risky borrowers through special measures, macroprudential wealth, various ratios for individuals with high debt burden um, assessment and, and, and based on the first contribution, the first tranche in terms of how much people are ready to put it up. But unfortunately, in the mortgage market, likewise, in the unsecuritized consumer lending every now and then some um, dubious practices take place which we fight against and we assess them from different angles. First of all, to what extent that may represent a systemic risk. For example, developer offered mortgage had in itself an absolutely systemic kind of risk, as well as simply people being deceived. And the last thing that you're referring to, this fee for arranging a loan. <clears throat> Effectively, that is an interest uh, advance payments uh, packed to a loan in question. That doesn't directly impact the cost of housing and the gap uh, between the primary and the secondary market in terms of its arbitration. But uh, a lot uh, here depends upon uh, how quickly an individual is ready to repay if an individual is going to repay throughout a substantially longer period of time, longer than the bank is expecting, and that is reflected in the interest rate and in the fee, usually that is a seven-year long period, for a consumer that could be a good deal if uh, the uh, loan is repaid earlier than seven uh, years, then an individual, the borrower, may lose. But an individual may not be aware of it. And so information, the level of awareness about such loans is necessary. We principally don't support any pre advancement of uh, such interest payments. And we are currently working with the banks on a voluntary basis. Together, we are trying to work out a mortgage product standard so it could be clear and straightforward and that the banks adopt it. If it doesn't help, like I said, we will resort to the legislature in order to adopt much tougher measures. You see, on the one hand, we ought to make it possible for the products to be differentiated because there are different life situations, different preferences. But of course, along with that, not allow the banks to really, uh, you know, squeeze the consumers out of their livelihoods because this non-standard mortgage product won't make it possible to differentiate between the individuals based on their preferences. But if it's going to continue as a mass practice, there's not going to be any other thing for us to do but to resort to tough measures. Yes, Mr. Zabotkin, and your question about the current decision um, affecting the mortgage interest rates. Uh, the, the point, uh, the pivoting point around which pricing is shaping up uh, towards the basic mortgage product is the federal bond yield uh, uh, with a five to seven year maturity. So if you take a look uh, that uh, from 1330 today, what happened with the yield uh, or this federal bonds, nothing changed and within that period of time, you see. So effectively, our key rate reflects the expectations that the market has already embraced by now. All right, thank you. Next question comes online from Julia Popova. Goodwill business publication from the city of Smolensk. Good afternoon. Goodwill business publication from the city of Smolensk. My name is Julia Popova. Elvira Sahib Zadovina, could you please tell us? Um, uh, so do you see the possibility for the consumer demand to grow and how that might impact inflation further on? Thank you. Thank you for your question. To say that the um, Demand is uh, 
suffering from any uh, artificial limitations. No, I mean, we're now above the quarter, uh, last year's quarter. And so based on the retail trade indicators and the service sector, we note that its growth continues now throughout the second quarter. And our monetary policy is specifically aimed at making the further growth of the aggregate demand at par with the economic productivity in order to um, provide for the real demand growth in physical volumes. Now, the demand growth above it would only impel inflation because it won't be possible to meet it uh, via producing sufficient goods and services. So our monetary policy is specifically targeting uh, the uh, situation whereby a growing demand won't push up inflation. Thanks. Inna, next one, please. Inna Aldoshina, Frank Media. I have one question. The Bank of Russia for more than one year now has been drawing the attention of investors that all information in the internet about the issues should be verified, <coughs> that uh, the anonymous telegram channel shouldn't be trusted, uh, but in as far as the investment topic is concerned, uh, these uh, have grown almost like mushrooms after the rain where, when official information was not available. Currently we see a reverse trend when the issues themselves move over to the dark side, helping the speculators. The fresh example, MKB the Moscow Credit Bank, which is being traded via the Moscow um, Exchange and is included into the top rating list, has disclosed its financial reporting in an anonymous Telegram channel and actually not simul not just one off or after the official uh, reporting uh, was uh, um, uh, open, but four hours just after that. So my question is, what does the Central Bank of Russia think about this kind of communication between the investors and issues? Maybe the insider manipulation legislation should be updated because of that. Well, I mean, wait a minute. Uh, could it be more specific? Has the MKB placed this information into the Telegram channel before or after official uh, reporting? Because he said, uh, you, you, because he said after. Oh, I'm sorry, that was my mistake. Yeah, we'll take a look. We'll take a look at the specific case. Certainly, you know, disclosing insider information before the official disclosure is impermissible. Thank you. Colleagues, are there any more questions? Yes, John, go ahead. Elvira Sahibzadona, good afternoon. Artyom Terejev from Forbes. Recently, an act, a bill, was uh, brought into effect which allows uh, uh, the non friendly uh, traders to directly participate in the Moscow exchange, supporting the liquidity with current, their national currencies. What's the purpose and can it reduce the pressure upon the ruble? Thank you. Well, the basic purpose of a direct access without intermediaries to FX trading to brokers and banks from the friendly countries <clears throat> is in improving the liquidity of the traded instruments, simplifying the settlements being done in national currencies. And we expect the main inflow of such players, particularly in as far as the soft currencies are concerned, but for the new players, will be subject to the requirements which are similarly being followed by the national players. No additional restrictions or limitations are uh, being planned uh, to be imposed on them. Uh, thank you. Next question comes online from Victoria Shergina. Vika, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much for the possibility to ask my question. At the St. Petersburg Exchange, uh, uh, the, some of the funds uh, that can be allowed to be bought that, um, as uh, the exchange reporting, are being kept uh, in a friendly structure. To what extent do you believe it is safe to invest in such paper because the investors don't see the full uh, chain of custody of how such securities are being kept and currently not possible to assess all of the infrastructure risks? Well, one should take into account that if you are trading in the Russian securities through a Russian infrastructure, certainly. The uh, registration of the foreign securities via a friendly infrastructure reduces the probability of uh, 
there being any infrastructure risk without completely excluding these. So we believe that investors should never cease to analyze and assess the risks related to such investments. And as far as we're concerned, we continue working with the market players so that in due way they should be disclosing to the investors any risks in relationship to such instruments. Indeed, it is impossible to completely alleviate those. But at the same time, as of last year, we've been undertaking measures in order to minimize the infrastructure risks when investing into the foreign securities. And even right now, non-qualified investors uh, cannot uh, buy uh, securities issued by non-friendly issuers. New uh, instruments are being allowed into the exchange um, uh, against the condition of being serviced by the friendly uh, jurisdiction representatives. And all the risks related to these are subject to notification. Well, dear colleagues, I think the press conference time is running up. Uh, are there any more questions, please? Dimitri, well, it's all right. Go ahead. Yes, I have a question about your forecast for the imports in 2024, which you expect uh, it will go down as opposed to 2023 level. Uh, so what can we say based on that about the nature of 2023 imports? And does it have any possibility to replenish the import stocks that have gone down this year? Mr. Zabotkin, please. Well, I guess... In terms of any scenarios related to what you've just said, I'm sure that they're there, but we're not really making them pronounced in our forecast. But what I can concede is that, indeed, the imports have risen very quickly because of the expansion of the domestic demand and uh, uh, the uh, 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 most of the restrictions being on the import side no longer being there. And due to the exchange rate dynamics, indeed, in the physical terms, the imports next year are going to be somewhat lower than this year. But nominally, if you take a look at the um, uh, payment balance uh, forecast next year, the import next year almost uh, um, conforms to the values this year. I mean, the negative values in, uh, in terms of the imports declining uh, in terms of its contribution to the GDP, it's uh, the real variable. But uh, nominally, you know, dollar-wise, it's the same one in 2023 as it is in 2023. Thank you. Thank you, dear colleagues. Yes, uh, thank you for all of your questions.